Okay, so beginning with programming in Haskell. Uh, my background before coming into Haskell was uh, a lot of web programming stuff, mainly using Perl. Um, and Perl is not a great language for doing web programming. It's, it's nice for kind of scripting stuff, but when you've got long running services, um, you really want a bit more guarantees of what's going on. So I was learning Haskell at the time, and I was starting to see these lovely static guarantees from the type system, how if it type checked, it generally would do the right thing and it would work. So I thought, this is, this is lovely in this pure sense, but my real day job is to do web programming. So how can I use Haskell to do web programming? And unfortunately, at the time, that was really not a very straightforward task. There's a lot of stuff that I felt that you had to know before you could even start doing what I thought were really basic things. So just to give you an overview of the kind of state of the art at the moment, um, Haskell is definitely a language that is ready for web programming. So we've got web, many different types of web frameworks. There's Snap, Scotty, Hackstack, and Yeesod. Um, they all offer different functionality. So Yeesod is very much kind of batteries included and very much like Ruby on Rails whereas things like Snap are maybe a little bit more bare bones. And then we've also got some domain-specific languages for the languages that we use on the web. Uh, Blaze and Lucid there to generate HTML documents. Uh, Jmacro is uh, Haskell DSL for generating JavaScript, and Clay can generate CSS. There's relational database abstractions such as Opali and relational record and system, which will give a nice Haskell syntax for uh, interacting with relational databases. And there's also support for non-SQL databases like HEDIS, which is for talking to reader servers, or ACID state if you just want an in-memory database, and of course, support for serialization formats. So while all the libraries are there, this makes it extremely daunting. There's a lot of choice, and if you don't really know which of these libraries you want to pick to get going, it's difficult to get started. So today, I'm going to walk you through building an application. So oh, yeah. Sorry, will you make sure slides available? Yeah, um, there's a link to that in a moment. The slides are online. Um, so today we're going to walk through building an application. So I'll, I'll make some choices of the libraries for us, and then we'll see how we can use these libraries to uh, build a really simple, basic web application. And the application we're going to build is um, something that allows participants of ZuriHack to share the work that they're doing, and also people at ZuriHack can have a, an overview of who's working on what. So the features there is people should be able to submit the projects that they're working on with a basic description, and we'll also mention who the authors are. Uh, and then people can view a list of all of these submitted projects. Uh, and our stack's going to use Spock as the underlying web framework. We're going to use Lucid to build the HTML documents. And we're going to use Postgres Simple to interact with the Postgres database. Um, and I'm going to assume basic web programming experience, not in Haskell, but hopefully some people here might have already done stuff in Python or Ruby or maybe Perl like me. Um, but of course, ask questions at any time. So if you get stuck on some of the code, we can bring up GHCI and look at the types and try and work through it. Um, and if you do want to follow along, maybe best not to do it during the talk, but you, it, um, if you did want to get set up, that's the general uh, approach that I suggest. So set up a directory, um, change into that, and then initialize a cabal sandbox there. And then you can cabal and install Spot, Postgres Simple, and Lucid with uh, just the one command there. And all of the code is available on uh, Darkshub. I'm going to put it on GitHub later as well, if that's more convenient for people. So uh, there's a link there. So before we jump in, I thought it would be nice to kind of summarize Spock in a slide, to, to build up a picture of Spock, if you will. So, sorry, that, that is the only terrible joke that's going to be in the slides, but I couldn't resist. So Spock consists of a couple of things. We have a basic HTTP server to serve applications. The server is based on um, a kind of underlying standard in Haskell called Y. Uh, we've also got a routing framework which will allow us to define HTTP paths along with the verbs and route those down into actual actions that need to be executed whenever that path is routed to. And then we have a domain specific language for working with HTTP requests and delivering responses. So in this DSL we can read information about the HTTP requests such as the headers, request body and so on. We can perform arbitrary I.O. and interact with databases. And then we can finally deliver a response back to the client. And I find Spock a really nice framework when we're learning how to do web programming in Haskell because it's, it's somewhat batteries included, but also not particularly opinionated on how you put things together. So it has built-in support for sessions, for managing an application state through the lifetime of the server, but also uh, database connection. 
Um, and Spot consists of two main parts that you're going to be uh, working with as you work with Spot applications. And these are separated into two different moments. Uh, and the, the, the separation here is because you can kind of conceptually do two different things as you build web applications. The first thing you need to do is to specify the routing and the overall shape of the application. And then the second thing is working in those individual requests and responses, which is uh, captured here by the two different monads. So we have the spot M monad, which we're going to use to structure the application, and then a spot action monad, which is what allows us to work with HTTP requests. So I think it's time to just jump in and start looking at some code. So we'll start with a basic kind of hello world of web programming. And the first thing we're going to do is define the action that runs to do hello world. And for that, we're going to define a Spock action here, which is called hello Spock. And in the body of the action, we simply emit a HTML string. So the string there is, is in quotes, so it's just a literal HTML string. And I've got some HTML in there to add emphasis. And in the type of this, we can see that Spock action it maybe look, might look a little kind of scary there with all the type variables, but um, essentially Spock actions can be parameterized over database connections, a session type, and your application state. In this case, these are all lowercase, which means they're type variables, uh, and that simply means that we don't care about the database type or the session or the state type. Because this doesn't work with the database at all, it just emits a single piece of HTML. So the next thing we need to do is be able to route this uh, action so that people can actually visit a web page and see our hello spot uh, example. So to do that, we work inside this spot M monad. And this is uh, the basic way that you introduce routes. Uh, first of all, we've got the HTTP verb there, which is just going to be a get. And then the string is the HTTP path that people will browse to. And then finally, we specify the action that will be executed whenever people do end up on that uh, action. And the last thing we need to do is actually turn this into an executable, so uh, a server that we can run. And we do have to do a little bit of work here. We need to specify what sessions are, how to connect to the database, and what the application state is, and finally a port. But for our example, this is all kind of um, not necessarily important. So I'm just going to kind of substitute in some dummy values. So don't worry about these kind of last three functions. They're just there as a, a kind of necessary evil, I suppose, to allow us to run the application. But the really interesting stuff is right at the top there. So we use run spot. We specify that we're going to run on port 8000. Uh, and then we uh, pass our app in there to the spot function. And run spot then is going to give us a executable HTTP server that will work with uh, requests and responses. So I can jump over to my terminal now, and I think I've got that code checked out. Yep. So I can then just run ghc make on that. I'm not using a Cabal project for this, although you could certainly use uh, Cabal if you wanted to. It's easy enough to just use ghc and make for this. Uh, that's going to give me a main executable, which I can run, and that's now running on port 8000. And of course, if I now visit localhost on port 8000, you see exactly what we might expect. So in only a couple of lines of code, we were able to start uh, getting some web programming done, which is, I think is quite exciting. So the next thing I want to do is start looking at kind of tidying this up. Uh, because so far, we've been serving the HD, uh, HTML just the string. And that's pretty horrific. We don't really do things like that in Haskell. Ideally, we want to stay working in Haskell as much as possible and avoid working with literal strings. And the reason we do this is for quite a few different reasons. First of all, syntax errors can be determined at compile time rather than at runtime. If we have a, a, a malformed HTML document, it simply won't compile because there will be syntax errors. Uh, we could also encode what it means to be well formed in the type. So we can actually start to not only make sure that the syntax is correct, but that it semantically makes sense. And finally, we can also use Haskell as a kind of macro language to do templating and use it as a means of abstraction. So ordinary Haskell functions can now be used to generate HTML documents, and we can use loops and things like that. And there are many DSLs for doing HTML programming, but I'm going to look at one of the newest ones, which is called Lucid, which I also think is probably one of the simpler approaches. So in Lucid, we build HTML trees using do notation. Um, so you, hopefully you can already see that the kind of shape of these functions looks a lot like HTML if you're familiar with writing HTML by hand. 
Uh, and lucid exports functions for all of the HTML5 elements, and it suffixes them with an underscore. That just prevents clashes with the standard Haskell functions that will be in scope by default. And to nest elements in this, we simply nest do blocks. So here we can see that we've got a HTML uh, element at the top, and then we nest inside that a head element and a body element as well. It's, uh, this is going on down here. Sorry? Uh, that's me failing to use a keyboard properly, I think. <laughs> Sorry. That is meant to be, yeah, only once, yeah. Uh, so um, <coughs> we can put text in Lucid documents by using a GHC extension called overloaded strings. And this simply means that now strings can represent <coughs> fragments of HTML. So here I'm supplying a string to the title element, and that's simply going to set the string contents of the title element in HTML to hello. I can do the same with the H1 and the B tag. Uh, and finally, to supply attributes to these HTML elements, we simply uh, supply a list of um, basically pairs of the attributes and their values. So here I've got a, a link down here. It's an A tag, and I specified that the href attribute is going to be uh, Haskell.org, and the contents of the A tag is the text of Haskell. Uh, yeah, so there is no kind of knowledge of what it means to be uh, to satisfy the HTML schema. So yeah, you can, and you can also do things such as create tables that have no rows or table rows that aren't inside tables and stuff. So Lucid does require you to have a little bit of care in structuring your documents, uh, but I think it's quite a nice kind of trade-off in terms of the kind of power to weight that you have to put in there. So, but A has two arguments, right? A a can have one or two arguments. So Lucid has a kind of overloading structure there. So uh, with the P tag, we could put attributes in there if we wanted, but we can also leave them out and just put a string in instead. Uh, and finally, as I said, we can now start to use Haskell as a macro language to start abstracting some commonality away. So in the first case here, with page template, I'm defining a function that takes some HTML and then it returns more HTML, and this is a kind of overall page template. So I specify the HTML tag, uh, I set the title of the page, but for the body of the page, I use the argument that was supplied to this function. So that's let me abstract out what it means to be um, a general uh, HTML page here with the HTML tag at the start and so a head tag. Uh, I can make kind of convenience functions here, like link. Uh, generally, when we make links, you just have a href and some contents. So rather than typing all of this out, I can simply uh, abstract this kind of common pattern by taking a URL and a caption and uh, just applying that to uh, an A element. So we can rewrite our hello Spock HTML example there by using what we've just built. So using the page template and we supply the body of this is going to be uh, what we had before. And also we can use our link abstraction there to easily generate links. So I think I got some code there that I can maybe pull over. So now, again, we've got a uh, slightly richer HTML document there that was generated entirely with Lucid, and we've got the link that we would expect. Oh, sorry, there was, there was one last thing there, which is how to actually get Lucid to emit this through Spock. So Spock only knows how to send text strings generally down the wire. The HTML function will set the content type header, uh, but it still only expects text. So to interact between Spock and Lucid, we need to render the Lucid data as text. Uh, and I've generated a little help function here called Lucid, which takes a HTML fragment and uh, just simply renders that straight down using the HTML function from Spock, but also rendering the Lucid data as text. So, so how, different yeah. is, how different is that from whatever um, from um, whatever the um, uh, ESOP is using, or is, is, is ESOP also using Lucid? I, really know. I think uh, ESOP probably can use Lucid. By default, it's probably, I think, uh, Shakespeare is ah, yeah, the Shakespeare. library they use, which is, um, they do go further than rather having, so what we see here is um, HTML data is just Haskell functions that yeah. pass around. Whereas the use of approach is to use uh, quasi-quotas and template Haskell, yeah, right. which we will see a little bit of later. But um, 
my personal preference is to work inside Haskell as much as possible, because yeah. yeah. then we can reuse what we've already learned. Yeah. So we've seen static pages, but obviously we need to introduce some uh, interactivity into our application. So we're going to connect to a Postgres database, and the first thing that we need to do there is tell Spark how to connect to our database. So there's a library called Postgres Simple, which um, I think gives you a very simple interface to talk to Postgres servers. And all we need to do to tell Spock how to connect to Postgres is to change our dbcon function earlier. And dbcon was supplied when we ran our Spock server. Um, so this is going to run on startup, and it's going to be aware now how to generate Postgres connections when we demand them. And all I'm doing is uh, I use the default connection info. And this syntax here is record syntax. So I'm just using the default connection strings and changing the user to be Zuri hack, and I'm also changing my database to be Zuri hack. And there's a couple of configuration options that you don't really need to worry about there, but uh, Spock gives you connection pooling. So if you have uh, an application with maybe a high load and a lot of people using it, rather than reconnecting to the database every time a request comes in, uh, Spock will keep a connection pool open and reuse connections with it as it sees fit. And in order to start pulling data down from a database, again, as I said, I like to work inside Haskell as much as possible. So the next thing I'm going to explain are model types as Haskell data types. So projects in this application are really quite simple. They just consist of a name, which is text, a description, which is text, and also a list of authors who work on the project, which again, just a list of text strings. And uh, to write queries using Postgres Simple, we can use this uh, slightly different syntax here, which is a little bit like a string, but it gives us the ability to have multiple lines. Uh, and this is called a quasi quoter. So Postgres Simple gives us a quasi quoter for SQL statements. And the reason this is a little bit better than strings is it's actually really hard to concatenate these queries together. And generally, concatenating queries as strings is a pretty bad idea in web programming because that's how you introduce all sorts of security problems when you accidentally start letting people submit uh, SQL statements to your server. Uh, and if you do want to get something that's a bit richer than just writing SQL out by hand, there are other libraries such as OpenAI and Relational Record, uh, but these do come quite advanced in my opinion. So uh, I, I generally do write SQL statements even in my own applications. So I find this quite straightforward and it's uh, very easy to test these. Uh, I can just connect to a Postgres server and try exactly the same query. And finally, in order to fetch the data, we have to explain to Haskell how to marshal between Postgres rows and our internal data types. And in Postgres Simple, there's a type class for doing this called from row. So if that's a question. Okay. Uh, and from row works in this kind of parser monad, where essentially we can enter do notation and we can pull out one field from our row at a time. So I extract the name field, the description field, and the list of authors. And here I have to work under the vector data type in order to get that array back. Um, but essentially, we're unpacking this as a list of text strings. And once I've passed each of these columns, I can then construct my project data type uh, just by returning project with the name, description, and authors that I read from each uh, database row. Is there a, like a generic method for generating this up in Haskell? There is. There's a library called, um, well, one of them, I think it's Postgres Simple SOP which is one generic library for doing this. And with that, you can just define your project data type. You have to add one line to say derive generic, and then you can say instance from row project, and you just specify basically a default uh, implementation. So you can do that, and in practice, that is also what I do, because this is quite tedious now. When the definition of project changes, you've got to go back and change it. So we've now got our uh, internal data type and a way to marshal it from rows back to uh, our internal data type again. And we've got a query that we need to run. So to run this, Postgres Simple gives you the query function. The query takes a database connection, and it takes a query that you need to run. And it's going to use return type polymorphism here to work out that you need to give a list of projects. Because you've specified that this is going to return a list of projects. So it's going to, it's going to use that from row instance that we previously defined in order to do that marshalling. Uh, so to integrate that with Spock, uh, we needed a database connection, which we've already got. And then Spock gives us the run query function, which lets us use that database connection handle. So we can see, first of all, one thing's changed. It's now our Spock action 
rather than being parameterized over all database connection types, uh, we're specifying here that it has to work for Postgres connections. And the reason this now only works for Postgres connections is because virtual projects, which we defined previously here, requires a PG connection. So uh, I can then use run query with virtual projects, and Spock's then going to supply a database connection to our virtual projects routine, which is then going to give us back a list of projects. So now that we've got a list of projects, we need to present that to the user. And now we can just switch back to pure functions and write some functions that turn single projects into HTML. So I've decided here to go with a, a basic table presentation. So an individual project gets represented as a table row, which is introduced with the TR function. And then the contents of the table row is to have three columns, one which is the project name, project description, and then I comma separate all of the authors inside the project. And we have to use two HTML here because the project name is specified as just being a piece of text. And of course, that text could contain HTML characters which we need to escape. So two HTML is going to do that escaping and make sure that we don't accidentally inject HTML into this uh, document. And to perform comma separation, I take the list of project authors, turn each one of these project authors into HTML, uh, and then I can intersperse there as a function that just puts uh, this element between every element of the list. So that's just going to put commas between every single one of these project authors. And mconcat then collapses that list of HTML fragments down into a single HTML fragment. So that's very much like concat for lists, uh, except we kind of collapse with a bit more structure. And finally, with a list of projects now, I can turn all of these projects into a single piece of HTML. So I introduce my table element, uh, a header for the table, indicating we've got name, description, and authors. And then I'm using fold map over all the projects, which is basically going to turn each of these projects into a piece of HTML by using project to row. And then it's going to concatenate all of those down into a single piece of HTML, which is now the body of our table. Um, so now we just need to wire this all together into Spock. So our get project action, which is what we started to define earlier, begins by fetching the projects from the database. Then we use Lucid to send HTML down to the client. We're going to use our page template that we introduced before to give it that general page structure. And then I use render projects to uh, render all of these projects down to the client. And there is a link here, which is a bit of a spoiler of what's going next, I suppose. Uh, and finally, we need to change our top-level application to in include a routing for this action. So I'm just changing our, our default action to now list projects. May I ask, um, how streaming is this um, with the laziness? The laziness you get attached to list, you could have some sort of streaming fun the functionality here. What um, the code you just wrote, how, how would this work? So, um, I think with the generation of the, the HTML itself, you, you are going to see some of the laziness coming in there. But unfortunately, that doesn't really give you any benefit because uh, Lucid, which actually renders it, is happening far later than this HTML generation. So what you're going to end up doing is building the whole thing up in memory anyway, and then sending it down in one day. But Lucid will like stream things out. It's, it's so I don't know how you can do streaming with Lucid. This won't stream day okay. runs. This will basically render the whole thing to a piece of text. That's one takes and then that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, actually, that said, Lucid um, does render as lazy text. Uh -huh. So uh, if Spock has support for streaming lazy text values, then you might be able to get that laziness. Uh, but I haven't used that. OK, so let's uh, pull that down and have a look at that. So now I've got a couple of projects that I've already got in my database, and we can see that table as expected. And there's a little bit of a bug here, I suppose you could call it. So if anybody's looking for an easy bit of code to work on later, then maybe you can try and clean that up. <laughs> I'll happily set patches for that. Uh, so the very last thing that we need to do now is to start allowing people to submit data to this application. Uh, so Spot gives us a way to read post parameters. Post parameters in, in HTTP, if you're not familiar, is basically what happens when you submit a form. And to read post data from a request, we have to specify the name of the parameter. And then uh, Spock's going to give us back maybe a text value that corresponds to that parameter. 
And I think there's something interesting happening here that you might not have seen in maybe dynamic and type languages, which is that Haskell is forcing us to be honest about what's happening here. It's not necessarily true that this parameter will even be present in the request body. Um, people may have tried to construct a form submission themselves, or you may have made a mistake in the parameter you're reading. So Haskell is forcing us to be honest and admitting that that could, could fail at runtime, and we need to be prepared for that scenario to happen. So that said, we'll, we'll dive in and try and read some data out of this. So the first thing that we'll try and do is read the name parameter from the request, and that gives us a maybe a name. And if we did get a name, then we carry on and we try and read the description parameter. And that might give us a description, in which case we go on. And you can see that this is becoming quite tedious and really quite messy code. It's hard to follow exactly what's trying to be expressed here. And in Haskell, when we have this kind of repetitive pattern, we want to look at some way of abstracting that out. So this is probably the, the most advanced thing we're going to look at in this talk. So this zooms past you a little bit. Uh, don't feel too bad, but there are a notion of monad transformers. So for people in the last talk, you probably looked at the, the maybe monad, which lets us chain a bunch of computations together with the chance of one of them failing. And if any of those computations fail, then the whole computation fails as a whole. And maybe t is a monad transformer that basically allows us to get that functionality on top of another monad. And we use maybe t by uh, working with two operations. First of all, if we have an, an operation that could fail, that is uh, an operation that returns maybe some value, we can lift this inside the maybe t transformer just with uh, this maybe t function. So that indicates that any function has the chance of failing. And finally, uh, once we've built up this large maybe t computation, we can run it with run maybe t, which basically kind of escapes out of this maybe t transformer and might give us back a value at the end. Uh, and the intuition here is the value you get at the end will be just if all of the subsequent computations could return a value, but if any of them failed to return a value, then we're going to get nothing back at the end. So knowing that we can use maybe t does allow us to uh, slightly abstract that code from before and just express the, the kind of essence of what we were trying to do. So now param, uh, name, description, and getting all of the authors out are things that could fail. So I'm wrapping each one of these inside maybe t. Uh, and then I can use run maybe t on this whole computation, which might give me back a project. Uh, it will give me a project if name, description, and all of the authors were present. But if any of these fields fail to look up, then I can't give you a project, so I'll return nothing overall. Uh, the only thing that maybe warrants a little bit of explanation here is uh, what's going on to read all of the authors. Uh, I've arbitrarily chosen that you can have five authors on a project. So I'm doing a, a basic map over 0 to 5 here to read each of the individual authors out. So we'll have author 0, author 1, author 2, and so on in the post parameters. Each one of these could fail, so I've used maybe t to indicate that chance of failure. Uh, and then there's a monadic action called sequence, which is a little bit like concatenation again, where we can basically run all of these. And if all of these succeed, then I will get back a list of authors. But if any of these fails, then it will return nothing, and this whole computation will fail again. Um, maybe t is, is probably a, a monad transformer that's uh, well worth having a play at, just kind of in general, outside this parameter parser and stuff. It's probably one of the more useful monad transformers that you will probably inevitably come across at some point. And uh, I have to take questions and, and walk through that outside this tool. And now we've got the ability to parse projects from post parameters, we can start to look at inserting those into the database. So to insert into a relational database, we just run a SQL statement here. So we've got another SQL statement called add projects, and that's going to insert into the projects table the name, description, and authors columns. And we can use question marks here to indicate placeholders. And Postgres Simple is going to substitute in the values for these placeholders when we run the query. So we need a way to run the query now, which is uh, here specified by insert project, which is going to take the project that we want to insert into the database, a database connection again, and it's going to perform some I.O. to do that. In the body, we simply execute using the database connection we were given, our add project statement, and in order to fill in these placeholders, I'm supplying the project uh, to execute. Uh, I should have mentioned that to do to, to, to actually pass in this project, you have to indicate to Postgres how 
it needs to basically unpack that project data type to work out which columns get which data. Uh, and there's a type class there called uh, two row, which complements from row. And when I switch back over to the terminal, I'll, I'll show you the definition of that. Finally, we can put all of that together to build another Spock action now, which is going to insert projects into the database, which are called uh, post project. And the first thing we do is use project from post, which is going to give us maybe a project. So project from post is the function we introduced earlier that tries to parse a project from post parameters. If we didn't get a project, though, um, we need to handle that scenario. So again, that's what I was talking about with Haskell forcing us to be honest at the chance of failure. So if we couldn't successfully read the project, uh, I'm just rendering back to the client invalid submission and changing the response status to 400. And if we could successfully get a project, then I can insert that into the database and redirect the user back to the listing of all projects. Finally, we introduce that into our routing table here using the post HTTP verb. The path is going to be forward slash project, and the action to run is post project. Yep. Yeah, I was just wondering um, if Spock provides a function that gives all the post parameters uh, instead of fetching all of them individually. So which would be nice to have so a list of all parameters and then like, mm. yeah. Yeah, um, there is params, I think, for that which will basically give you back a list of pairs and mm -hmm. post parameters and their value. But the, the same problem is going to apply though. You don't know what's in that list necessarily, so you will still have to do some kind of parsing and failure handling. Mm -hmm. But it might be easier because you can do it in a pure sense. Yeah, of yeah. course. Uh, so we can't actually test that action out so far because we haven't got a way to make those post requests. So the last thing we need to do is a form that's going to allow people to submit projects. And for this, I've got another Spock action called add project form, which is an action that doesn't require database access at all. And we can see that as we've got a, just a type variable up here. We're not requiring a Postgres connection. And in the contents, uh, I'm using our page template and our Lucid functions again to simply render back a form, which is going to be a post to forward slash projects. And the contents of the form is uh, fairly laborious, we just have the project name, which is an input field, description, which is an input field, uh, <coughs> author rows are <coughs> constructed one at a time, so we have five author rows for the five post parameters that we expected, and finally a submit button at the end. Uh, to generate the author rows, I'm using mapm, which is uh, going to go through this list of zero to five, and for every one of those numbers, emit this chunk of HTML. So we're going to up there with five. And uh, oh, we do need to add routing for that, which I don't seem to have in the slides. So let's just pull that down. Uh, I'll just show you the source code there as a kind of finished state. So here is the routing. We have our uh, top level get route. Then we have our post route, which is going to post a single project. And then we have a get action, which is going to use the add project form. And uh, I just wanted to show you that two row instance as well, which is what's allowing us to send rows to the Postgres database. Uh, so hopefully you can see that. Just slide it down a bit. So two row takes a project, unpacks it into its uh, constituent parts, and then we just basically emit that using a tuple because uh, Postgres Simple already has support for sending tuples to the database. So we unpack our project into a tuple and uh, use that instance. And again, you could do this generically. And the matchup is by a tuple position. So the, the first one goes, there's no, there's no name right. identifier. It's just yeah. the position. Yeah. The tuple. Okay. So we do have to be careful though that when we write the SQL statements that we get the order right. consistent with what we have there. So I can now run that. And add project shows us the rather horrible form. Uh, does anybody have any projects that they're working on at the moment? Okay, well, one I know that has been worked on is uh, Haskanoid, which is uh, FRP game framework, I guess we can call it. And I think that's Ivan who's working on that. And then if I hit Add Project, you can see that's went straight into our database. We've been redirected accordingly, and uh, we can see our changes directly in the page. And we've obviously got the same bug as before. So that's uh, everything I wanted to cover uh, in terms of the actual 
code that we're going to look at. So I think it's nice if we just recap and, and uh, recover what we've looked at. So first of all, we saw that we can use Cabal and Cabal Sandbox to set up a basic dev environment. I didn't really go into that because that's not my personal workflow, but if anybody is having any problems with that later, just give me a shout and uh, we can work through that. And then we saw how to use Spock to serve a HTTP application, specify the routes inside that application, and specify the logic of what needs to happen inside each of those routes. And that was working inside the Spock M monad and the Spock Action monads. And then we also showed Spock how to connect to a Postgres database so we could run database queries uh, against Postgres. Then we used Postgres to do just some basic read and write statements. Um, we used to row and from row to specify the marshalling between Postgres database and our Haskell data types. And we used the uh, SQL quasi quota to embed SQL queries directly into our source code. And we saw that we could execute these queries with the query function and the execute function. <coughs> And then we assembled all of the UI for our application using the Lucid uh, domain-specific language. And we saw how to create basic HTML documents uh, with uh, kind of constant values, and also supplies our project data types in there so we can uh, make these HTML documents dynamic. And we also saw Haskell as a means of abstraction over HTML trees. So we broke out that page template, and we saw how we could use uh, common functions like maps and folds and concatenation to uh, basically uh, use Haskell as a templating language for HTML documents. And then we just saw briefly, uh, although I skimmed through it quite quickly, um, what is perhaps some slightly more advanced Haskell development, although I think it's uh, better Haskell programming, which is the use of abstraction with the maybe T moment transformer. Um, so that's everything I wanted to cover today. I, I, I guess we did go through this quite quickly, but as I said, all the code is online. Uh, the docs commits are kind of meant to be in sync with the talk here. So if you want to walk through the talk with the Darks repository at the same time, that should be possible. And obviously I'll be around for the rest of the day. And if anybody wants to kind of hack on this project and try and improve it, maybe fix some bugs or improve the UI, um, then yeah, definitely open to pull requests on that as well. Uh, but yeah, I think we can take some questions now. Uh, if you do hack on the project, coordinate on IRC. <laughs> okay, that's the Zuri hack for IRC. Yes. Do you have the URL for the slides and stuff as well? You were going to yeah, uh, I'll just zoom back up to that. I'm going to put this on uh, the Haskell Z GitHub repository as well, so uh, yeah. I'll, I'll do that sometime today. I was under the impression that Spock actually offers some more safe way of accessing those parameters. Uh, yeah, so we uh, use the simple oh, uh, library from Spock. Spock also has a safe one. Uh, I obviously wanted to get simplicity. Uh, the safe one gives you a slightly more type safe way of doing routing. I'm not sure if it's post parameters. I thought it might just be for uh, URL parameters. So if you have like a uh, get project forward slash one, and Spock can tell you that you expect an integer there, and if you don't get an integer, it simply won't do the routing. Um, yeah, if people want to look at using the, uh, the safe Spock interface, we can also look at doing that later. Yeah, talking, about, talking about simple, um, how far does that Postgres simple get me, and, and for what reason would I have to use whatever else there is in mm -hmm. Postgres safe? I don't know. <laughs> So Postgres Simple does give you uh, a pretty extensive coverage of what Postgres can do. So you can do obviously queries, and because it's just using SQL statements, you can send any query you want. It knows how to do streaming results. Uh, it can support some of the more advanced features of Postgres, like listen and notify, which is kind of like a Postgres internal pub sub system. But you might run into problems as you start to build kind of large applications with this that change over time because we saw that the SQL statements don't carry any type information at all. They're just SQL statements and you have to specify what you expect back. But if what you expect doesn't match up with what's in the query results, you'll just get a runtime error, which to me is a little unsatisfactory. So some of the other libraries like Opali and Relational Record give you uh, maybe a monadic interface or something that lets you put a lot more information in the types at the cost of being slightly 
harder to express it. Um, so at work you usually stick to Opali? We're using Opali at work at the moment. I'm also very interested in the relational record work because I think it's a slightly simpler API than Opali. Um, but we used Postgres Simple for a good year and a half, I think, until we kept running into problems of changing data types and then queries would just break the same. Uh, it's nice for this kind of work, I think, that you're just sketching the prototypes. Eh? Mm -hmm. um, what about hosting uh, those kind of projects? Uh, well, for a few goals, like, uh, how easy or difficult it is to deploy? Yeah. Um, so the, the build product that we got, as we saw, is just a, a binary. <laughs> So if you are able to maybe get like an Ubuntu server or something and you run Ubuntu locally, then you can just compile and copy that binary straight over. So that's like the, the kind of easiest way of doing deployments, I think. There are other options. Um, there's Haskell on Heroku. So if you, ah, it's Heroku. Um, uh, I think the attack is here as well, maybe not in this room. Is he next door? Okay. Uh, so there's also Miatek who works on Haskell on Heroku and also has a project called uh, Halcyon, which is helping do this kind of deployment stuff. And it's not native from the middle of the right, it's just a... Uh, uh, I'm not sure exactly how it works. I think it's shell scripts that work around for it. Um, but that will do things like pull down GitHub repositories, pull down dependencies for you. Um, it also does caching, so you don't have to constantly recompile everything. Um, so that one's um, to look out. <coughs> Done a bit of web programming, programming now with uh, Yesod, mm -hmm. and <clears throat> I want to do a small lightning talk uh, at home about uh, web programming and Haskell, and try to convince uh, PHP people that there is advantage <coughs> in doing web programming with Haskell. And uh, the problem is, although PHP is crap, <laughs> there is such a large amount of PHP and so many people doing PHP that in the, they manage to have many, many libraries and it's hard to pitch with Haskell uh, when there are still so many uh, things that aren't there yet. Mm. For example, I've asked on Haskell Cafe and uh, on the web devil list and on Yesod web there is nothing to do um, security checking in mm -hmm. Haskell, I think. No ACL framework, no nothing to check roles and yeah. to persist them to the database. And um, in Symfony they have um, a web developer toolbar that gives you all kinds of mm -hmm. information mm -hmm. about the web request. And uh, what else did I? I, my impression is now that I would rather go with Yesod to pitch against PHP with, because it's a more feature rich than Spock and Spock's more bare, bare metal. Yeah. Is that right? Spock to me has the benefit, because it's kind of so bare metal, it should be possible to bring in libraries that do this type of specific functionality. The downside is, as you said, the libraries don't exist yet. Uh, with Yesod, you have maybe more features, but they don't always <coughs> transfer very well to the rest of the Haskell ecosystem, which I find is a, is a little uncomfortable to me because I don't use these, I don't use Snap, personally, and it's hard to borrow those ideas, which may be why we have such a kind of lack of these general libraries, is because it's quite hard to make a general library that's reusable over all of the web frameworks. But your point, your point is definitely valid. I mean, this is... <coughs> It's only in the last couple of years, I think, anyway, that Haskell became really suitable for doing web programming when we started to get frameworks like you saw really coming up to scratch. So it's, it's slightly just the, the problem of being so new. But I, I, I see the, the landscape changing quite quickly as more people want to write web frameworks in Haskell and web applications in Haskell. They're willing to do that little bit of extra work to make these libraries available. So hopefully we'll be able to compete with PHP in terms of their feature-rich ecosystem. But we can't at the moment. So I don't, I don't really have any tips for your lightning talk in that <laughs> sense. Um, also, what you're saying with like having like the toolbar snap and things like that is kind of where we wanted to go with the snap framework, which was meant to be, there was a concept called snaplets there, where the idea is if you wanted to add like a wiki to your application, you've just installed the wiki snaplet. And if you wanted to add a like rendering performance information to your application, you'd get the rendering performance snaplet. And again, 
these are kind of ideas that have never been fully fleshed out yet. But there's potential that it may happen, and I'm optimistic that it will. So it's, I guess the only thing you can tell them on is it's that you believe that it will get better, which is not necessarily very convincing. <laughs> What about integration with Bethel test and web servers like Nginx or Apache? Because I wouldn't be so comfortable by running <laughs> my whole app on Spoke Native Server. Uh, well, this is this is kind of how most apps are run. I mean, when you're running like PHP apps with Nginx, you're, you're kind of still doing this. You may have the PHP fast CGI thing running behind the scenes or whatever it's called. Cool. Uh, but these servers are actually really quite performant. So I, I'm. I think that the Spock server is, is actually quite a performant one because it's based on top of the Y framework. And there are benchmarks if you want to have a look at this. Uh, I admit there are downsides there of running just kind of executables that maybe run fast, but you don't know the security implications. But these web servers have more stuff like certificate checking and. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but you can put your Apache or Nginx in front of it with, as a burst proxy. Yeah, yeah that's true. So, so I host a work with a, it's a Snap <coughs> server, not a Spot server, but we do SSL termination at Nginx and then reverse proxy down to this. And that's also, Nginx is then doing the load balancing and things like that. And these just run on machines that are doing very little more than running an executable, which I think gives you quite a nice uh, architecture for scaling. Because these machines now just need a binary to be running on them, and then they can spin up quite quickly, and they don't really have any dependencies. What about WebSocket support? Because the last time I checked in Haskell well, it was like a year ago, it wasn't really mm -hmm. using um, There are two libraries for that. There is the WebSockets library, which gives you access to just the underlying WebSocket protocol. I'm not sure if Spock will support that yet. It's, it is a kind of server agnostic library. I know it has support for use of the Snap, but maybe not Spot. Uh, and there's also a library that I maintain called Socket.io, which gives you bindings to the Socket.io JavaScript library. So if you want something that's a bit more kind of pub sub orientated, then there's also that library, which you don't have to worry about the underlying WebSocket implementations. It does the fallbacks. It does the fallbacks as well, yeah. So uh, not pub and things like that. Cool. Then lunch, I guess. Uh, not right now. In 15 minutes. Okay. So yeah. Thank you.